Welcome to DABCC Radio, where smart people listen. Virtualization and Cloud Talk, featuring cutting edge solutions from the hottest companies around the globe. Broadcasting from the DABCC offices in sunny Sarasota, Florida. Surrounded by computers, books, and Legos. A Microsoft MVP, Citrix Charter CTP, VMware V Expert. And your host, Douglas Brown. Hello, everyone, and welcome to DABCC Radio. This is Doug Brown, and I'm very excited about this episode. I'm very excited about sharing this conversation with you. And today we have, well, we have the gentleman that I call the demo god, one of the greatest demoers of all time. And you're probably quite familiar with him from Citrix, his time at Citrix. His name is Brad Peterson, and Brad uh, was responsible for so much at Citrix, but he has since left and he has found his way to a great company called WorkSpot that talk about disruptive. These guys are, well, they call it VDI 2.0. And it's, uh, they also say this is VDI done right. So what does all that mean? Well, Brad's going to tell us. And Brad is about one of the most articulate guys I've ever met and just a true great conversationalist. So I think you'll really enjoy this conversation as much as I did, if not a little bit. Well, I don't know about more. I enjoyed it very much. So what do I say? With no further ado, let's go into, let's, you know, let's do this thing and let's uh, chat with good old Brad Peterson from WorkSpot. Okay, Brad, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I, I can't believe we've never had you on the show. What a travesty. So I'm really excited about this because we're going to talk about oh, a little bit about WorkSpot, what you're doing nowadays, but we're going to talk about the industry as a whole, where you see things going, where you see the world as we, you know, as it is today, things like that. So this ought to be a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it should be. And I can't believe it either. How long have we known each other? You know, it's crazy. We, we, do you remember where we met? Oh, Oslo, uh, 150 years ago, yeah, <laughs> back we, in the Viking days. <laughs> we did. We I actually met Brad in in Oslo, Norway, and uh, I don't think I think I met you before this, but uh, we went out on a boat, and the, the we were at a conference, and the Norwegians rented this boat or two boats, uh, an old like, like Vikings ship, boat, and we a sailed. Ship. Yep. It was off in the fjords that we went out, and they had shrimp and bread and, and drinks and bands and stuff like that. Remember that? That's exactly right. And you were dressed in the traditional Norwegian outfit. Oh, yeah. What was that? Right. It's like, I look like Ben Franklin, if you convert it to sort of American style, right? They told me that it was the right thing to do, that every year it was National Day, and everyone would wear these things. And it was like they would get married in these things. They yep. said there's like, there's like a suit, and there's a tuxedo, and then there's this thing, and I can't remember the name right now. Anyway, they had me in it. I looked like Ben Franklin. I did the keynote that year for the user group meeting, and uh, it, plenty of pictures. It turned out to go, uh, to go very well, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll never forget that one for sure, and I'll never lose those photos. No, 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 no. I remember that very well, too. It was very uh, a lot of fun. That was, I think, 2004, 2005. It shot 2005, maybe. Maybe 2000. It is because it was right after we were acquired. I was a net six startup yep. company. We were acquired in. We came up the Access Gateway, and I kind of took it around the planet and launched it everywhere and sort of uh, had a great time in Anglo uh, launching with those guys. I think I was with Anthony Rico back at the time. You remember him? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yep. So we traveled all over Europe uh, kicking that thing off. And then, by the way, after that, I stuck there. I went over and lived in Zurich, Switzerland for a couple of years and did business development for all of the appliances that came into Citrix, Net6 and NetScaler and Orbital Data, you know, the WAN uh, optimizer, branch repeater, right, and all that stuff. So two years in Europe, it was fantastic. That is that is awesome. You know, I'm living in Berlin nowadays, so I'm getting that. Uh, well, I live both in Berlin and in America, so I, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's a lot of fun. But, hey, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So for those who don't know you, <laughs> Can you yeah. tell us who you are and maybe a little bit about your past or a lot about your past? Tell us a lot about sure. your past. Sure. Let's back up. My, you know, um, so here's the deal. You know, I was at Citrix for 10 years, but then, you know, I did a few things before that, too, if you want to back up even more. Originally, I am a Midwestern uh, kid just like you, right? I came out of Wisconsin. 
And growing up, I played a ton of ice hockey and uh, drums, you know, forever. So I've been played in every different type of band you could ever imagine. Uh, in fact, by the way, uh, 2014, my last year at Citrix, I was back in Oslo again for the Citrix user group meeting and went and presented with those guys. And they had a theme that night. It was pirates. And so we got all dressed up as pirates and the band played. And later on that night, I actually sat in and played drums in a pirate suit in Oslo at a user group meeting. So I've check seen out. those pictures, too. <laughs> exactly. And then, by the way, every year for uh, Citrix uh, Summit, I think we would do the Summit Cup and we would get all of the employees and partners together that played hockey and they'd bring their bags in. And we had a, a hockey tournament that was great every year and we would, uh, you know, sponsor that and we'd have the, the cup and, uh, you know, logos on the jerseys. And that was a ball also. In fact, John Burris, you know, the late John Burris, who was the VP of sales at Citrix, he was the first sponsor of that. He was the executive sponsor to kick us off. And that's been running almost, you know, 10 years now, too. So historically, a little bit of music in my blood, a little bit of hockey in my blood. And then, yes, I uh, got acquired into Citrix and spent 10 years there. First two years, I was in uh, Zurich, Switzerland and working all over EMEA. And then I came back to Santa Clara and I built their first ever executive briefing center right in Santa Clara. And that's where we host CIOs and all their uh, uh, directors of IT and so forth and have tremendous business conversations with them. And then in the end, you know, I think we built about nine of those EBCs around the planet in like Munich and London and Paris and Sydney and Singapore and various other places as well. So it really got us connected to kind of the mid-market and the enterprise companies that were out there. So that was fantastic. The other thing that when I came back from Europe and I got back into the U.S., I started going backstage during Synergy and I found kind of a snarled mess of cables and, you know, demos and stuff. And uh, I kind of cleaned it all up. And over time, you guys might know that, you know, Mark Templeton and I spent a little time on stage during those keynotes telling stories and and doing full on live demos of products and mobile devices. And most of it worked and some of it didn't. But, you know, it was all live and we had a great Great time. I don't know. You might remember a few of those. I, uh, it's you know, you are a demo god. There's nobody, <laughs> nobody in the Citrix world that's ever, or anyone that's ever been to a Citrix Synergy or Summit that does not call Brad Peterson a demo god. And they're well, not just great demos, but they're smooth as silk. Yeah. And you know, if there's a problem, time. you don't even know there was a problem. That's how smooth this guy is. They were awesome, and we miss you so much at those those demos. Yeah, well, and I hear there's a uh, there's a synergy coming up uh, right around the corner here. Yes, are you guys going to be at synergy? We are not going to be at synergy. Uh, well, actually, I you know it's like here's the deal. I should be more clear about that. Um, and we'll have a chance here, I'm sure, to talk about uh, the workspot and what I'm sure. up to now. Well, that's my next question. If we we'll, we'll get to it, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. And so in that world. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of the next generation uh, of Citrix, and we're talking to the same customers, but we're offering something that's a bit different, and, and we'll go into that. And so, uh, you know, in that world, the great thing about Citrix is the community, you know, the 20 years of the IT uh, folks that are out there that are either resellers or consultants or customers, uh, tons of customers, and they come back and they feel like they're a part of that community. So, um, to be connected to that community over the years, um, had, to me, has been the most amazing thing ever. So I just think uh, Synergy is just one of the lightning rods of that community, bringing them all together, uh, getting those folks connected, and then taking a look at uh, the next year's technology. So, yeah, no, that's a great event this year. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know if you guys would attend. I know you guys were there uh, last year, um, not as an uh, official part of Synergy, but just sort of around. There's a lot of guys that do that. You know, like you said, it's to me, it's almost old home week, right? It's like a high school or college reunion. Um, yeah, you'll I, find us uh, not officially there, but you'll find us very unofficially there. Uh, and so for anybody that wants to talk directly uh, to me and some other folks uh, specifically about what we'll share with you guys today, you should definitely know that I'll be in the zip code uh, come Synergy. So, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. That's what I wanted to get out, Brad. And we're going to talk about WorkSpot right now. So, um, well, we're going to talk about a, a bunch of different things, the industry mm -hmm. as a whole. But real quick, or not real quick, there's no time limits here. Um, <laughs> tell us about WorkSpot. So, what are you guys trying to do? Why did Brad Peterson, the demo god of all yeah. gods, go to WorkSpot? Well, you know, it it's even starts before that. It's not like, why did I go to WorkSpot? Yeah. Why did I leave? Why did I leave Citrix? Sure. You know, it's like I was there for ten years, and like I said, a couple in uh, Europe, and then a bunch of years back, uh, kind of working globally. 
And uh, for me, uh, every single day I'd host CIOs in the briefing center and I'd have these discussions with them. And all along the way, we really ran into visionaries back in like 2000, sort of 9, 10 and 11, even in those years where they said, hey, you know, the cloud is coming. You know, it's everything is different now. It's like when when Google and Amazon build clouds, they don't buy off the shelf products from brand names that you buy and put into your data centers, you know, Mr. Customer. They're actually, uh, you know, building a lot of this stuff from scratch, and they're doing it um, in completely different ways. You know, they got a system administrator for every, you know, 100,000 CPUs running in there, and their cost for storage was way down and so forth. And they, they wouldn't even go into a data center and fix anything unless the entire rack and they roll the rack out and replace the rack. I mean, talk about a redundant array of inexpensive disks. You know, uh, these are like a redundant array of inexpensive racks, for crying out loud. So we were hearing and sensing all this stuff early on. And then, of course, what happens? You know, Siebel Systems is doing CRM at the time, and then Salesforce comes in about 16 years ago. And Salesforce goes, no, no, we're going to do this thing real simple, but it's going to be cloud-based and massively scalable. And you get to customize a little bit, but you don't get to do that crazy Siebel stuff. And Siebel's gone now, you know, and Salesforce is this massive flagship, you know, success story of a cloud-based uh, service, right? And so here I am all the way up into 2014, and uh, Citrix made the conscious effort of actually really not uh, pivoting the business and really investing in that entirely and putting the crack top team on that and so forth. And so you know what I did? I, I actually said, well, you know what? It's been a great 10 years, and I went off to DocuSign. OK, so I go to DocuSign. Now, that's an e-signature company, but it's massive parallel processing cloud service. So I just went to school inside that place. And what happened was, uh, you know, like 60,000 new users a day on that and 60 million total users. And, you know, the engine behind that was global that processed that was interesting. And the marketing and the sales efforts associated with finding those people and pulling them into the fold was just like brilliant. So after about a year and a half of that, I end up running back uh, into Amitabh. Uh, who uh, Amitabh Sinha, who's our CEO at WorkSpot, and he uh, used to be the GM of ZenApp and Zen Desktop. But four years ago, he pops out of there, and he joins Paneet Chawla, who's our CTO, and he was the first engineer over at VMware building out uh, uh, desktop virtualization. Those guys get together, and they just said, you know what, we're going to do it. Right? We're going to actually create the first cloud-based VDI control plane, that's massively parallelized. It's built on microservices in a cloud, fully redundant and failover and all that sort of stuff. It's multi-tenant built in and it just scales to millions effortlessly. That's the way you build that stuff, right? And so now the beauty of that is, is that you tie that into any infrastructure that you want, whether it's three-tier, hyper-converged, or even sort of Azure Cloud, and then you can put your apps and desktops on those. We'll spin it up and make it available to the mobile users wherever they are. So there's no more massive price because it's all subscription based and there's no more uh, complexity because the cloud is done for you, you know, right? And then there's no more scalability problems either because it scales with you. And it's also a single control plane that controls the infrastructure across your LA data center and your New York data center and then maybe some Azure in London and some Azure in Singapore. It's one place to control and monitor and get analytics sort of for all of that, right? So, you know, that was it. You know, 10 years of domain experience at Citrix, doing it the only way you could do it back then was to deliver software and, and turns into a science project, right? But that was the only way you could do it. And then now, uh, you know, a year and a half, almost two years over at DocuSign, just going to school on the cloud and operations, and then ending up here with my old uh, friends at WorkSpot. I've been here a year now, right? And it, it represents the combination of those two things together, sort of the VDI and the desktop as a service, apps and desktops and delivery and all that stuff that CIOs need. And then marrying that with domain, the domain of like a DocuSign, which is a massively huge parallel processed uh, cloud service in the sky. And so that's what we are up to. And we couldn't be happier. We're uh, growing the business uh, faster than you might even believe. In fact, I'm running around uh, shooting videos now with customers for video success stories and putting that in. And, of course, doing my a lot of my own videos and putting them on our resource uh, page on workspot.com slash resources. So go there and, and check that out. If you grab a little bucket of popcorn and you watch those videos, you know, before you know it, you're going to know all about us, all about our architecture and how it's different and how people are being successful on it. So, you know, that's a little of the backstory and it kind of gets us caught up.
Very interesting. Very interesting. And and um, guys, definitely check out what, what what Brad's put together as far as videos go. Like I mentioned, the guys the demo god and and they're smooth as silk, and they're they're usually a little funny too. He uh, has a good sense of humor to him. So uh, oh, that's right. Well, back in the Citrix days, I did that Wow to How video. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Which one was that? Well, it's called Wow to How. Every year, we did it about four years. I would shoot this Wow to How video. It was about twelve to fifteen minutes long, and I was like a golfer on a golf course, and then I was a doctor in an office, and then I was you know uh, uh, somebody working at home, and then I was on a train, and then you know I was on an airplane, and so I was in all these different scenarios and these use cases, and we shot these videos and boiled them down. And then the way we did it as a marketing program is we made them available in about seventy-five theaters across North and South America. And we drew in a bunch of IT professionals to watch it in the morning. And then in the afternoon, they would see the premiere of Tron or the premiere of the next Superman or something like that, right? So huge campaign we did. And and those videos were educational and entertaining in a sense, right? And then a lot of the folks that consumed those, you know, we'd see those people at, um, at Synergies and other events. And they would always give us great feedback on that as well. So a bit of fun. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I know what you're talking about. So you mentioned something interesting there. You you mentioned that the leader of the space is not always the leader when the world changes, so to speak. Why is this, Brad? When the world changes, yeah. You, you know you what know I mean by that? Told, well, go ahead. You, you describe what you mean, and then I'll jump in. Oh, that it sounds good. So think <laughs> about, th- I'll give you the scenario of books. You know, I'm a big book fan. My, In fact, I'm surrounded by books right now sitting here in my office and the first thing I did, every single city I ever moved to, and I've lived in a, a slew of places, is before I found the McDonald's, before I found the gas station, I found the Barnes & Noble. And yeah. I went there. I loved it. I lived it. I bought so many books. Where's Barnes & Noble today? Well, they're probably in some of the same locations, but not every location. Nowadays, if I want a book, I don't go to Barnes & Noble. I go to Amazon.com. And right. Barnes & Noble's nowhere to be found. Why? And that's a very interesting question. And, right. and it's, not, it's not unique to the transition from brick and mortar to Internet either. It's, it's, it's universal. Well, it's yeah, I, I agree. In, in the books world, boy, you know, I actually get a ton of books. But more often than not, I actually get Audible, audible.com, like these podcasts, you know. Yep. I love grabbing podcasts and Audible, and I put them in my headset, and I'll either listen to them in the car if I'm driving or every day or every other day I go to the gym, I am always listening to some sort of book or podcast. So the, the form has shifted. I remember years ago when we used to go to Blockbuster and rent, you know, uh, VHS tapes yep, and then DVDs go. and all that sort of stuff. That's it's like, no. Great example. All that, no, it's streaming now. That whole thing changed. That stuff's gone. And so the flexibility, the on-demand, it's it, like we didn't have the networks for it before. It couldn't have happened. That, that was the only way you could do it before. So it made sense. But guess what? Is In the blink of an eye, you know, network ubiquity, bandwidth, device speeds, uh, you know, the, uh, the screen resolution on the supercomputer that's in your pocket, it's all enabled it. You know as well as I, 10 to 15 years ago, people had these mobile phones and they were horrible and they said the future is in the phone and it was awful. And it's like I couldn't even imagine what we're doing now on phones that we're doing now on them, right? It's crazy. So, by the way, the same sort of thing has happened in this world that I described, you know, earlier. The cloud is there. The networks are ubiquitous. Backend uh, uh, public cloud computing is just getting inexpensive and available and so forth. And so now it's the time. Now, I have this analogy that I use quite a bit with some uh, folks to sort of get uh, understand the transition. And the question is this. If you and Christine were going out for dinner, would you open up your phone and make a call to an organization that would have a truck come by and drop car parts in your driveway and you would assemble the car and get in the car and go to dinner? Or would you call Uber or Lyft or some other service to take you straight to dinner, eat, and then come home? It's like, which one would you do? Well, of course, you would never do the science project, right? But what you got to realize is that in the world of VDI 1.0, you know, sort of the Citrix VM world of yesteryear that we were all a part of, and we refer to ourselves as VDI sort of 2.0, it's like you would never do that. Why would you actually have all that software dropped off on your driveway and you would assemble it from scratch like a science project and sort of kind of get it all going and need PhDs and a lot of time and so forth uh, just to get your desktops and apps delivered? It's like, wait a minute. No, right? So instead, you just get a service. Well, that's WorkSpot, right? Because when you think about it, the whole world of EDI, there's two components to it. The first component on the top is where you're connecting in and you're brokering and you're load balancing and you're provisioning. The part underneath that is infrastructure, 
Now, infrastructure is where the apps and the desktops go, right? So infrastructure could be the old three-tier stuff that's there, or hyper-converged, or it could even be cloud-based infrastructure. It's like, where are my desktops? You know, they're on-prem or they're in the cloud. But wait a minute, what's orchestrating them, right? And so VDI 1.0, you know, yeah, it's been around a long time. That's the only way you could do it. But now it's like VDI 2.0, so WorkSpot, right? Full-on multi-services, runs on microservices, multi-tenant, infinitely scalable cloud control plane for load balancing and brokering. Infinite number of desktops and applications can be just spun up on demand from one browser interface, and those apps will be spun up or desktops on-prem in any city you want, or they'll be blown out in any one of the 38 uh, regions of Azure around the world, and it's all subscription-based. So it's one single price for you know all of that, right? So that could never have been done before, right? You couldn't do that 10 or 15 years ago, but obviously you can do it now. Like I said before, Salesforce is the shining example of the notion, right, that you can actually do CRM in the cloud as a service. Think about this. In the early days, smaller companies were taking it on and using it. It was wonderful and glorious. But in that, that inflection period where Cisco chose to move their entire Salesforce onto, uh, onto Salesforce, and then other companies of their same size moved over there, then you knew. It was like it just kicked over to the other side, and it was all about the world is ready for that, right? Yeah. And so so it is time to flip. It is time to change. And it's interesting that the VDI market has not had that transformation. So we've been working on that architecture for four years here. Uh, there's product market fit. Uh, and we're f- flipping customers over onto it all day long. And the cool part about it is, is that imagine this. It's like all of our activity is on the phone. All of our sales activities on the phone, all of our implementation and customer success stuff is over the phone because it's all browser based and it all connects in and it all works. And it's all done in a fraction of the time that it ever was before. So it's all changing. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, Are companies like Citrix and VMware not able to just replicate what you guys do? I mean, they have a lot of money, a lot of people, right? Well, they do. Now, the problem and the difference, one of the differences, we have no, you know, I don't have 20 years of customers that I have to go and maintain their happiness on old uh, versions of software and various other things like that, right? So, you know, you become a big, mature company over many years and, you know, you kind of slow down and you're associated with a long tail of customers. The other thing that happens is in those cases, you do acquisition over acquisition over acquisition over the years. And we're in Citrix have both done the same. And so if you look at their architectures, you can kind of pick them apart and you can even name the companies that they acquired to get those things glued together. And when you do, you find there's 10 or 15 different user experiences associated to matching them all. But guess what? That also means they're all stateful pieces of software. They're stateful. This piece of software does this. And it has to talk to this piece of software that does that. And it has to talk to this piece of software that does that. If any one of those versions of software are like out of version and they have an incompatibility, you don't get in and get to use anything. And it's stateful, meaning that if it's gone, if it crashes, it's out, there's nothing to take its place, right? Now, that's the way you used to do things, and I get it. For 10 or 15 years, you build on that architecture, and that's what you do because that's how it was done. That's not how you build a cloud architecture, right? Cloud architectures are microservices, those microservices spin up and they take on the task that they need when it's required. You know, 10 users come in or a million users come in. Microservices spin up. They take on the task of functioning uh, and processing what those users need. They go into a data pipeline and pull the data out and process it and put the data back. And then that microservices actually goes away. It's massively dynamic. It's like fireflies spinning up when you need them, right? And so that's fundamental difference. And so the trouble is, is when like a Citrix, you know, they try to go, oh, wait a minute, I need a Citrix cloud, right? They just take all that software that's been acquired in, you know, multiple different company names, different user experiences, um, tons of stateful chunks of software talking to each other. If anything goes sideways or is out of spec or whatever, you know, that's trouble. And they move all that into the cloud and then they call that Citrix cloud. And of course, that's for one customer. If they get a second customer, they have to copy and paste all of that crazy software. And now that's for the second customer. Now they got to patch and maintain and so forth and all that. And the other trouble there is this. That software was written to run on-prem. And because it was written to run on-prem, it's actually going to – it's going to – It's going to travel all the authentication and the data flow is going to go through that software. And it seemed like the right thing to do when it's on-prem. The problem is, is when you move your control plane into the cloud, 
it's the last thing you want to do is to have authentication and data traffic go through the cloud, right? What if I've got, you know, like 300 thin clients in a call center, and I'm, I even have an on-prem set of Nutanix boxes, right? Now, I can't use Citrix Cloud because I'd authenticate and all my traffic would go through Citrix Cloud. It's like, no, I mean, that's, that's crazy, right? And so, no, you know, in the WorkSpot world, our cloud is the control plane. It has sort of dotted lines that come down and it configures the Nutanix and it configures the thin clients or any other device you're using. And it tells those devices to go and hit the Nutanix box directly. Like there's no cloud-based authentication or data flow whatsoever. And so it's just built and it's optimized to actually be the next generation architecture and product. And to be fair, you know, we don't have a 10 or 15 year history of, of acquisitions and customers we're trying to uh, keep happy. We had the, uh, the uh, distinction, the, the, uh, you know, we could afford to take the four years and build it out massively clean for the next, you know, 10 or 20 years going and looking forward. So with the right cloud architecture. Yeah. And that's really the answer to almost the answer to my, my question I asked you about, you know, like Barnes & Noble, the, the analogy I gave you is those companies have a lot of legacy, right? I mm. call it the Microsoft effect. You know, why was, you know, Apple... I think they changed their OS a couple times where the old applications would not run. Microsoft never done that, right? Everything was always no. backwards compatible. And Microsoft got a lot of grief for it, but they had to in order to keep their customers, their existing customer base happy. So yeah. they could never really change and expand and give us the innovation in the in what Apple was able to do. And in return, Apple took, you know, a, a chunk of market share from from Microsoft and gave oh, yeah. us a really beautiful experience in the process, right? Totally. I mean, yeah, that their hands were tied to do those sorts of things. But it's interesting to see some of the changes. See, there's the other thing, the notion of selling the whole piece of software or monthly subscription. Like how many companies have successfully transitioned from one to the other? Not many. No. You know, you could you could say Adobe. OK, I used to buy uh, Photoshop for six hundred dollars, but now it's ten bucks a month. Well, look, that's hard to do. That's hard to, to switch that financial model from one to the other. Now you got Microsoft, right? So I used to buy, you know, Word, Office, and all that, and now it's a, uh, you know, it's Office 365. So they also worked hard. We're smart enough to transition from one to the next, and it's hard. Your bottom line gets hit. Your um, investors and so forth, you know, they might wring your neck while you're doing it. But in the end, the new, the annuity stream is the future, and if you can get there, you can. And the other thing that's brilliant about Microsoft is their billion dollars, uh, billions of dollars of investments in Azure. You know, they're coming late after Amazon. It's funny to see Amazon Web Services had figured this out. The bookstore figured this out first and built this massive, huge public cloud, which now is being consumed. And, and it's a huge contributor toward their uh, value as a company. So uh, the interesting thing is Azure's coming in back uh, right behind it, you know, three, four years behind it, 38 regions strong, and now Microsoft is all about con consumption of, of their Azure. You know, Gardner predicts now that in the next two years, by 2019, you know, 50% of all VDI deployments will come out of the cloud. And of course, you know, uh, Microsoft and Azure, they want that, of course, to be them, uh, and that's why they're building this stuff out. So we believe and we agree that that's the case, and that's why we partner with Microsoft. You know, we're a Microsoft managed partner, and specifically, one of the highlighted areas is in the EDU space. So we work with them on all spaces, and uh, we are already deploying customers um, in a hybrid mode, where the WorkSpot cloud is controlling and load balancing and brokering uh, desktops and apps that are on prem on infrastructure at the same time in Azure. You know, and we have big clients right now where we're uh, deploying Azure. Uh, Windows 10 desktops that have GPUs in them and they're doing CAD development and so forth, right? So that transition is already in place. And it's so funny when we talk to some customers, it's happening so fast. They'll see other people do this and they'll be on some old three-tier architecture and they'll actually just skip a hyper-conversion and go straight into the cloud, you know? Sure. It depends on the use case. It depends on, you know, how connected they are to others that are having success doing that. But it's totally the future and they can see that that's uh, the direction everything's going. Absolutely. And, and you are so true. We are totally, as a, as a world, we're moving away from the consumption economy into a, a subscription economy, yeah. right? It just, uh, and if you're not there, then you're going to be, you know, not there. And that's not going <laughs> to be a good thing, right? Yeah. You know, it's so funny because, you know, everybody over the last few years, and you know this, they've, well, years and years ago, they built out their data centers and they were proud of them, right? And then, oh my God, the, the CapEx. And so now they're re reducing their data centers and they're, you know, distilling them down to like, oh, now I only have two. And now they're the smartest person on the block. They've only got two and they're leveraging them. 
the problem is, is in the bigger companies, they've got users that are all over the planet. And so now we work with these folks and we go, hey, listen, you got a big base in New York and one in London. Good. You know, put some hyperconverged in there. And you got a lot of people around it. Great. But for your folks that are in L.A. and Singapore and, you know, Hong Kong or whatever, we're going to deploy things for them in Azure. And you're going to do all this under one one roof. And by the way, you know, when you think about it, that example is a big enterprise company. And to be fair, we work with a lot of mid-market folks as well that don't span those areas. But we also work with a lot of MSPs. So the managed service providers think of it this way also. They want to be either in a region or maybe even multi-region, and they want to have uh, their customers either on-prem or in the cloud. And through WorkSpot and it being multi-tenant, they grab that and then they can support that all day long wherever those folks are. And that they aggregate the control and they get, aggregate the insight of all the activity back to a single place in our big data analytic engine. And they get insight into that uh, that they had never gotten before. So it's really working across the board. Very cool. Very cool. So you keep mentioning the cloud. Um, and I want to ask you a few questions around the cloud. So the world is definitely moving to the cloud. One, you know, where are we with this? Two, uh, what are some of the hurdles people are facing moving to the cloud? Are there hurdles still? And, uh, you know, what are what are the CIOs, the, the companies that you're talking to, you know, are what are they saying about the cloud? Well, um, it, it is a bit surprising to us that it's it's happening so quickly. You know, these trends you'd think typically, uh, you know, they take five years or even longer, you know, 10 years and so forth. But the interesting thing for us is that we are seeing the confidence in the cloud happening just exponentially right now. You know, even a year or two ago, the confidence was not there. And so now it is there. And so now, and by the way, the other thing about this is, it's like, why would they do it with works? Cloud, right? Well, it's, you know, when we combine forces with Microsoft, and by the way, everyone realizes that Microsoft is trying to work with everybody, you know, well, probably other than, you know, VMware, but anyway, though they're obviously they've worked over the years with Citrix forever, and they'll continue to, and they're working with us famously. Uh, the, the thing, when we think about um, Microsoft now, we think about Microsoft Azure, and Azure just put billions into their uh, Azure regions around the world. And all they want is Azure consumption. So whoever's going to bring them Azure consumption, you're their best friend. And so that's why we're working with those guys. When we combine forces with them, um, it's a couple of things happen. First of all, our customers get a ton of confidence. You know, we're the control, load balancing, and so forth. But Azure is the platform that they run on, and the Win 10 desktops come out of, and the GPUs are launched in, right? So good. They have tons of confidence there. The other thing that we're doing differently, though, is this. We're saying, hello, okay, what we're going to do for you, uh, customer, is if you need 100 seats in L.A. and 100 in New York and 100 in London, you just get on the WorkSpot UI and you configure that in. WorkSpot provisions it all for you in the background, and we send you one bill. Because, Doug, you know as well as I, if you go in Amazon or Azure and fire off some uh, resources, you know, some desktops and that, and you forget they're running, the meter's running all the time. You're going to get a bill, Right. So our customers love the fact that we're aggregating it, deploying it on their behalf for them. We send them a WorkSpot bill that, that reflects all the costs associated with the whole thing behind. And we are giving them fixed cost pricing and multi-year contracts as well. So there's no, there's no unexpected risk in it for them. Now, the beautiful part about that for us is the more customers we bring on board, the economies of scale we get within Azure, because, you know, collectively, if we have... You know, a customer with a thousand users or a thousand of those customers, you know, that's a million users. There's economies of scale there. We also have the ability now, because we control it all, to go in and do intelligent management, you know, power saving, power things down um, when they're not being used, watch user behavior and have things ready, you know, for certain people. Do burst pricing, you know, for education and that sort of thing, right? Because we can monitor all of those things across all of our customers all at the same time, and then make intelligent decisions going forward. Not only that, but while we're monitoring all of that activity, we turn into a bit of a security engine also. Because again, if I have a customer with 100 users and another customer with 20,000 users, and then collectively all these other customers with millions of users, WorkSpot has the aggregate insight across all of those individual devices that are working all day long, where they're coming in from, what networks they're going over, uh, what the response time is over their carrier and so forth. I mean, we could come back and actually uh, share with other customers, you know, the average response time between AT&T, Verizon or Swisscom or whatever it might be. 
We can also find rogue devices in the world that are like uh, jailbroken on certain uh, uh, OS uh, values and so forth. And if they go sideways, we can let the rest of our customers know to be suspect of these types of devices, right? So if you think about VDI, it's always been islands of little chunks of VDI around the world that were desperate and never talked to, to each other. So now this all changes. It rolls in under my roof. Uh, WorkSpot represents the single cloud that aggregates it and monitors it and gathers the insight. And then, of course, for the for the public cloud infrastructure part of it, then the 38 regions of Azure is the safe repository. And again, taking advantage of their CPU and their memory and their GPUs and their networks and so forth, and then making all that available to our uh, our wonderful customers. Right? For me, it's always about the customers. It's always been about them. And so I think we have such a great story for them. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It's all about the customer. At the end of the day, that's what IT is there for. IT is not does not create anything other than a custom, good customer experience, right? At least that's what their sole job is to create a good customer experience. I think so too. And you know what's fun is like when our customers roll up and they get everything going, um, I go and visit them. Like I said, we do some case studies. I uh, shoot videos with them and so forth. And the beautiful part is it's actually we're delivering on the promise of VDI, right? They don't have to actually spend all day long suffering with the plumbing associated with VDI. It's in the cloud now, right? It works for them all the time. And their infrastructure, you know, I've gone into data centers where two-thirds of the data center is empty and there's air conditioning units pulled out in, and on the corner of the, of the room because they've, they've got just a small rack of hyperconverged left in there, right? So they got a rack of hyperconverged that's taking up about a tenth of what they had in there before, and they've got WorkSpot in the, is the control plane in the cloud managing all this with the WorkSpot client out on all the mobile devices. And it's all working so well, they actually are telling us about other projects they're working on within the IT organization now. It's the first time, right? Oh, they get to go, oh, strategic advantage. They get to help their, their uh, CIOs and their C-level execs think about the company and think about um, promoting the domain of their company, you know, if it's legal or healthcare or whatever it might be because they're not wrestling the plumbing to the ground anymore. It's fundamentally changed. The combination of hyperconverged and then even Azure and then our control plane together, all those three things, it's just changed the complexion of the IT organization and they're so massively happy in that world. Do you, do you think it, infrastructure is the reason for, may I call it the failed year of EDI? Well, I do. I think that's the first reason because, uh, and we have a, we tell that story, you know, it's like, Historically, the complexity of three tier and trying to build that out and saying, you know what, I'm going to support 500 users and you build out your three tier and then, and then you acquire a company with 200 more and then you look at your infrastructure and you got to break it into pieces and redesign it from scratch, right? And so, and it was also way too slow. So what happened in like 2013, 14, when Flash came out and was cost effective, things started to speed up. And then when Hyperconverged came out, those, those two things together really solved the infrastructure problem. And then people are reducing data centers down. So now you got Azure in a region where you no longer have a data center. So now you've got breach, you know, with Azure as well. So that's solved that part of the problem, right? But there's always two pieces to VDI. There's the piece that's the control load balancing brokering plane, right? That's control plane. And then you got the infrastructure. So we have witnessed you know, the, the fixing of the infrastructure problem with Flash and hyperconverged and then marrying that with Azure. It's like the infrastructure part is fast now and it's wonderful. And now we, WorkSpot, represent the notion of fixing the control plane and really putting it out in a massively parallel, but a unified single uh, place where you can pull everything in, you know? So, so the combination of those two things uh, together is really what's changed everything now. Okay, makes sense. So since the world is changing this fast, and we, we everyone can agree with that, where do you see it going? Where do, and, and particularly, what, what does the future of EUC look like, let's say in five years? Well, I tell you, you know, from our perspective, um, as we work with these customers, um, we're, we're, like I said, we're connecting in their on-prem and their Azure space and so forth. And historically, there was a lot of work to do because it was a science project. You had to install it and, and maintain it and patch it and all that sort of stuff. And you should never have to build a car before you go to dinner, right? You should just have a service. And we are, we are a service. 
But what we want to do is actually even automate it even more, right? So literally, um, right now, as we work with customers, you know, we're, we're, we'll work with customers that come in and they go, like, I need 100 desktops or I need 1,000 desktops or I need 5,000 or whatever it is or apps and all that sort of stuff, right? And so we go, oh, great. Okay, so let's do this. We'll hook it up to Azure. And, you know, we work with customers to take their templates, right? This is their Windows 10 image and it's uh, cleaned up and it's in a template form and we bring it into Azure and we connect it into their network through IPsec or Express Route and we do all the stuff you got to do, right? And in doing that, we're working very closely with Microsoft because this is new to them also to get all the networking right and the images well behaved and all that. And so I see this uh, going forward such that it'll be way more automated, right? You'll push a button and it'll happen, okay? You'll push a button and it'll, know, it'll, it'll have solved all these problems before. So WorkSpot will actually automate all this stuff, and that really helps in many ways, right? If you think of a big enterprise company and they have some departmental needs, they themselves can kind of push a button, provision um, uh, you know, some expansion within a region, whether it's even on-prem or not, and do it all self-serve. And then the other really cool thing is if when you think about sort of the bottom of the pyramid, you know, there's a ton of people out there today that want five or 10 or 20 or you know, 25 you know, apps or desktops, and uh, it's more difficult for them. Certainly, they don't work in the Citrix world at all, right? Because it's like it's way too expensive and complicated. And so I see the future way more self-serve. We've got this architecture now that is massively scalable and can handle just about anything. And we got Azure behind it. And then we got a whole bunch of hyper-converged out, which customers can handle and we can connect and make all that work. And, uh, and I see, you know, sort of the future of this just being absolutely self-serve, just configuring it, saying what you want and spinning it up and using it instantly. And by the way, the other thing is, is it's, it's not going to be like any, you don't have to over provision anymore, right? So historically, every data center in the world had to over provision because they had 100 people working in the middle of the day and then nobody at night. And every single building down the street, you know, one by one by one next to each other was all built out and over provisioned, right? So that should go away as well. So this should be more automated, more self-serve. It should be, um, you know, on demand in some sense. And so what will happen is IT organization will have to wrestle way less with the plumbing and they'll have to over provision and spend way too much for what they really need. And then they can focus that time and energy and money back into their business to make them competitive and really focus on their value add as a company. That's what I see going forward. Very interesting. Very interesting. So what happens to incumbents like Citrix and VMware and, you know, traditional PC vendors? Uh, you know, so good question. Uh, that is a great question. Um, you know, it's funny. A friend of mine works at IBM, and I was uh, I was playing hockey the other night. When we got done, we were just up uh, chatting afterwards. He's been there for a long time, and it's fun. I didn't realize these guys were still selling uh, mainframes. You know, of course. IBM. They're of still course. selling mainframes. The other thing I didn't realize he was telling me is like they still sell tape for backup, right? Because it's like you know, imagine even if you think about television news programs where they have the news every night and they have to record and archive all that stuff. They're not going to do it on spinning discs. So they're still archiving it off the tape. And, and if they ever have to go back 10 years and pull a tape, you know, they have big tape jute boxes and all that sort of stuff. Right. So I think there's a lot of old stuff that's still around because it makes sense, even though, you know, normal, uh, a typical company may not be using it there. There's a need for it and so forth. And I think that's what, uh, you know, has to sort of – Citrix and, and their customers have to ask them, does Citrix fall into that camp? Um, you know, in my mind, the, the Citrix cloud um, is not the right architecture. It, you know, it doesn't scale. It's not going to help these customers and so forth. And so uh, is that going to fundamentally change? Do they do something differently? And, and, of course, right now, you know, the kind of the microscope is on them because uh, there's been discussions of will they go uh, private equity or will they be acquired somewhere and tucked in under a different brand? You know, of course, those rumors have been around since the company has been around for 25 years and more. Yep. Uh, but but who knows what will happen now? But uh, that's a great question. You know what? I would turn that question right around on you, Doug. What do you think? What do you think will happen to those guys? I think they'll just get smaller and smaller. Uh, I, I In IT, uh, things never die, right? Like you said, like you mentioned, you know, uh, IBM still sells mainframes, right? So, yeah. um, you know, as the world changes and as we start moving into more of a one, a subscription economy, two, into more of a cloud economy, I think one of the keys to success with, with cloud-based DAS or cloud-based anything is putting the data where the application is. 
And if we can do that, then we're going to get a, you know, better experience. You know, a lot of, I always say to people, why did we put in Citrix in the first place? You know, back when it was just called Citrix, right? There was just one product, Metaframe mm-hmm. or Winframe. Mm-hmm. We put it in there because we wanted to get a better user experience because our app was located next to our mail server, next to our file servers. And we could, you know, download a, or get access, view our, our, our data, our, be it, you know, our uh, email to our, you know, uh, line of business app, what, what have you, a lot quicker than we could via the good old Cisco VPN, right? It was right. a bridging technology, too. And as that bridge, as we get closer to the other side of the river, so to speak, into the future, then that bridge, you know, we don't need that bridge as much. But it'll always be there. Those companies are never going to die off. And if anyone says they're going to die, well, let's just talk about Novell for a little bit. You know, they're somehow still around. <laughs> but I don't right? consider Citrix or <laughs> VMware anything like that or traditional EUC, traditional computing to be like a Novell. Absolutely not. Uh, no. It'll always be around, but there'll be a better way to compute the same way Citrix brought a better way to compute in the, in the late 90s, right? I think so, yeah. And by the way, imagine like today, like five or 10 years ago, how the world was vastly different. And if you think about exponential growth and change, think five to 10 years going forward, right? Oh, yeah. It's the computers, the supercomputers in your pocket are going to be even more powerful. And the networks that we all communicate over are going to be mind-bendingly fast. You know, I just came off the GTC conference this week, which was NVIDIA's. Oh, uh, nice. NVIDIA's. Yeah, it was right here in San Jose, and I tell you, you go in there, and they've got all the artificial intelligence. It's and amazing. The augmented reality stuff that's yep. going on, and you put the, the little headsets on and stuff, and you get blown away. Yeah. And, and it's like it's not even experimental anymore. So, so much of everything is going to change. So when you do have to have desktops, and you do have to have apps, and they do have to connect back to data sources and those sorts of things, right? You can These things can be fluid. You know, when networks are as fast and as ubiquitous as they are now and as they'll continue to be, those things will move around and connect and talk to each other securely wherever it might be. And so, you know, you get you get a bit of help there, right? Yeah. And so I think one of the, the huge benefits going forward, assuming that the, the storage is less expensive and CPU and GPU and networks are all really, really good, it's like you've got to aggregate. Now it's all about data, right? That's what I learned at GTC. Everything there is data. Yep. And so the why is NVIDIA doing so well now? It's not uh, because of GPU CAD CAM development. It's about artificial intelligence. It's about using their GPUs to parallel process information, yeah. you know, like self-driving cars. They're doing all the scanning of the images everywhere, and they're processing that real time, right? Yeah. Or, you know, seismic data and parallel processing of all that. Well, you know, we are driving our big data engine inside WorkSpot and just filling it full of years of insight of patterns of usage and all these other things as well. And so we, you know, that's that's it. I mean, the future is pulling that together and, and pulling the insight out and bringing the value out of that, not only for, hey, these are recommendations based on what we see now, but these are also security policies associated with these behaviors as well. So that is uh, is another shift, I think, going forward. And it's just going to be key. And CIOs and directors of IT will, uh, you know, very soon, you know, sort of mandate that sort of insight because they'll be used to it in all other aspects of driving their business and they'll expect it there too. Yeah, you got it. The world is not, I always like to say, uh, it's, uh, the, the NVIDIA blog is actually one of my favorite blogs. And, and maybe 1% of what I really read relates to enterprise IT. The rest is, you know, uh, um, smart cities, uh, AI, things of that nature, right? In the world, I like to say the world is not powered by Intel. It's powered by the GPU. Right. Oh yeah. Well, hey, Jensen, their CTO, CEO. Sorry, on the keynote, he went he went all over that. He goes, Moore's law is at the end. You know, the the unipro- the single processor yep. itself is like you know it's like at, uh, you know the, the physics won't allow anymore. And he goes, now it's all about you know his world. Yep. And they just spent three billion dollars with thousands of engineers over the last three years building the next generation GPU. And he showed it on stage. And it's just leaps and bounds out in front of every other one, other brand and competitor. That Which brings us to the next thing you said was exponential growth. And if people don't understand, think about ex- what exponential means is if we go to fill a cup of water, right, just a, a glass, and we want to fill it with water, and it took us 100 years to fill that, the, 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 just a fraction of a centimeter of a millimeter will take 99.9 years. In the, la- in the rest of the 99.9% of the cup is going to be filled in the last fraction of a second, right? That's exponential growth. So, right. and we're getting there and we're seeing that in every aspect of IT, right? Or every aspect of our world in artificial intelligence. I mean, we could be 
a fraction of a second away from pure AI. We're not, but we could be, and we wouldn't see it coming because of exponential growth. It's quite fascinating. Uh, well, Elon uh, Musk, uh, Elon Musk, you know, SpaceX and Tesla yep. and Solar City. He oftentimes cautions about AI and all that because he's always way out ahead of the curve, and he's thinking about what you're saying that uh, sooner than we think. Yeah. Uh, you know these smart machines um, that do machine learning. By the way, machine learning, right? You don't write code. You actually have systems that write code, and they do massive parallel learning, and then they rewrite it and rewrite it and relearn it, and you're stepping back and watching it happen. Yep. Yeah, Elon Musk is sort of uh, uh, concerned that that will then, uh, you know, grow out of control and sort of be problematic to the human race. And, you know, he's a smart guy. So yeah, I would it's, like- it's interesting. I just finished a book, uh, I don't know, six months ago. And you like books. It's called uh, Surviving AI. And it, it's a really great book, Brad, because what it does, it talks about a, everything, the good and the, the positive and the negative. And then it says, okay, here's the positive. And, but then people say the negative and it gives a, uh, how do I say this? It gives a, um, it tells it without opinion, you know, like a very neutral, this is, these are the facts of, and it could go this way, but then it could go this way, but it won't go this way because of this. And it's, it's really fascinating. It does a phenomenal job with explaining, you know, the, the, the potential evils and the potential goodness of, of artificial intelligence in the future. Right. And just, oh yeah. Well, really, by the way, it's, it's, it's kind of like cloning, you know, yeah. it's like, there's all sorts of advantages with stem cell and cloning that would be wonderful for the universe and humanity. And if put in the wrong hands, you know, obviously uh, it would be bad. Yeah. And I think the same same goes for machine learning and all this stuff. So I would take that book and I would flip to the last chapter and see what the answer is. Do we survive? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> actually he was very optimistic, which is a nice way to end a book. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I was going to ask you what do you, what do you think of AI of this? You know, the the idea of the singularity, right? If we can digress into artificial intelligence conversation and the singularity Cursor. conversation. Uh, um, or di- yeah, digress into it. Uh, it's yeah. it's. I'm sort of glad that I'm old. Uh, I'm not that old, so I might You're not be able to survive see it. the singularity. I don't know if I want to see it. Ah, well, I think it's going to be a hump. I think what's going to happen is we will get there. It's a matter of time, um, uh, unless our governments stop it, which I don't think they will, or do they have the power to. And um, so we will get there, and then it's going to be a hump where we're going to see huge disaster uh, um, before we see the goodness of it. It could also be something like pure communism. And I don't want to get into a political conversation, but communism in the sense of you read Marx's manifestos, manifestos, they talk about the three phases of communism. But yet we've never got to the third phase because man never gave away the power. Right. And mm-hmm. I think that's a, that could very much happen within artificial intelligence, too, where we never give get to giving back to the community community because the owners of the machines don't want to lose control. And uh, so it's it's I don't know if I want to live through that. My children definitely will. You know, my children will probably never drive a car, never order a toaster. Right. I, I think Elon Musk is suggesting that even if people think they'll have uh, machine learning and and allow it to go just so far and never let it get out of control so that the people always have control, like what you're saying. Sure. I think Elon is, is suggesting that they'll lose control. It will slip out of their grasp. Well, they, and it, it has become to. more powerful. It has yeah. to. And this book talks about this. It's a great book. It's called Surviving AI, guys. Listen, if you like it, it was an interesting read. There's an audio book for it, too, so you can listen to the audio book. And uh, they talked about it. They said, you know, you can put it in a one of those boxes. What are those boxes called where you can't get in or out of it? You know what I'm talking about? There's a name for it. It's a physicist, I want to say. But anyway, um, uh, you can put it in there. But the first thing you're going to teach the computer is don't die, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you need to stay living. You need to do this. So now the computer sees, okay, who are my, you know, my, what's my competition? You know, who are my enemies? Yeah. And maybe they mark human beings as enemies. You that's know? the problem. Yeah. So if their code rewrites itself and it does that, then that's an issue. There, there were these bots. That, uh, I think even Microsoft or somebody put out a few years ago, self-learning bots. And I think what happened is a bunch of sort of pretty nasty people got a hold of it and sort of taught it bad language and bad ideas and stuff. And the bot went crazy, and they had to kill it. And so that was uh, early experiments in that space. So. By the way, like we said before, I think there's a ton of good that can be done, you know, for for spaces and people that are focused on that. And then yeah, you hope we avoid some of the evil. So that would be a good thing. But well, the by, by the way, is, 
Every positive has a negative, right? Every yin has a yang, and that's just the way it is. But back to sort of the future, too, I think, you know, one of the things we're going to see in the next five years is uh, 5G, right? And when 5G oh, yeah. comes around, that's supposed to be faster than what I have piped into my, my home. So, oh, yeah. so you know, so that cool. changes things, too, right? So the traditional desktop changes because now... You know, we're moving, you know, we're, we're, we're able to truly work anywhere, any place, anytime with no limitations of bandwidth. Right. And then oh, yeah. we can see things. Samsung just released a, a really cool thing. They call it the Dex, which is sort of Chris Flex Nirvana phone, where it's a cradle that you put your Samsung phone in and it connects to the monitor, um, you know, mouse, keyboard, everything. And it's just a, it's, it's the, uh, it's the cradle or the, the, the docking station for your phone. And, and that's going to be happening in the future too, right? Where our phones yeah, will be would, our computers. You would wonder what you need a docking station for when Wi-Fi gets ubiquitous and super high speed. Everything would be wirelessly connected, yeah. right? So, do you even need a docking station? You know? Yeah, that's that's a very good point. You don't at that point, right? Because Bluetooth will be fast enough. Uh, um, 5G will be here. Uh, um, we'll be able to power things over uh, um, over the air. Yeah, you're right. In fact, I hear yeah. even here, although I've heard these rumors for quite some time, is that uh, the next iPhone's going to be power, you know, be uh, Wi-Fi powered or, or wirelessly powered of some form. Not Wi-Fi, but wirelessly powered. Yeah, so, oh, I think I think that's the deal. I think the they're figuring the wireless stuff out faster and faster. It used to be the day you'd be working at home, and if you had to transfer a big file, you would connect up to your Ethernet cable, you know. Yep. And it's not so much that way anymore. No. And nowadays, half the time, you know, even when I travel, I don't even bother hooking up to the Wi-Fi. Um, I, I tell you, yesterday, you know, I was at the uh, GTC conference. And they provide free Wi-Fi, but when you go off the Wi-Fi, and I'm on AT&T, and you get LTE, um, 4G, uh, it was five bars and screamingly fast yeah. right from ATT. I didn't even use the wireless there. Yeah. So it's like, you know, the future is going to get even better. So that's really great news. So so uh, I have to ask you, who wins? You know, who wins the cloud? Who wins? You know, who's the... Uh, huh? it, it's interesting because let's go back in time, right? Let's The 80s were IBM. The 90s were Microsoft, right? The mm -hmm. 2000s was Google, you know, uh, um. Now we're in, you know, the 2010s. What are we, we really the IoT world, which hasn't been baked out yet? But you could, you know, who's the what's the, who's the next big guy? You know, where's the what? Yeah. What happened? Who wins? Is Google, Amazon, Microsoft? What's going on? What do you? Well, think? if you if you separate out the fact that the world is going to be full of IoT devices and so forth, and there's a huge market for there, there's AI and there's all that stuff. It's like yes, that's huge, right? Hold that to the side for a moment. If you just take a look at just the enterprise world that we've known forever for a long, long time, right? Those guys are all stuck. Still, some of a lot of them in their own data centers, you know, with all their own service and so forth, and they're going to have to move to the cloud. Right. And so if they are and these po folks have had these long term relationships with Microsoft, you know, paying licenses for Windows 7, 8 and 10 and just everything in XP and so forth and all the applications and Office and now Office 365. Right. Office 365 demonstrated to the IT organizations of the world that, yes, they can retire their exchange servers and they can put this in the cloud, you know, check mark that that built a lot of confidence and everybody's doing that. Now, when they say, okay, I'm going to have to move my desktops and some other apps and various other things to the cloud, they're probably going to look to Microsoft for that, I think. And so we're going to see this massive land grab of Microsoft um, pulling it into their Azure cloud right out of the data centers. And I understand Amazon Web Services got the big lead on them. But when you think about Amazon, it's kind of these rogue developers that are spinning things up and doing development and spinning them down. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of other use cases also. I just got this feeling, you know, with Microsoft's focus on this, with them setting up their licensing to be favorable for this, right, that the IT organizations of the world, certainly the enterprise and certainly mid-market, are going to migrate everything over to Azure. So I see as Azure as a massively strong contributor. AWS you know, is a hugely strong contributor, right? I, I agree with you. And I think that the other thing we have to think about when we think about Amazon is is the government. And, you know, at what point does Amazon, Amazon get too big? and sort of have you know you know what i mean and i think that's going to come into play it sounds sort of like wait a second you you totally took us off left field uh uh yeah but it's 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 a piece of the pie that i think could happen especially with someone like a trump in there that's sort of anti-bezos right it could be but you know the government has this cloud first attitude now 
So they've been given that edict, and they actually, whenever they put new services together, they have to go and look at new clouds. And guess what? Amazon has GovCloud, right? Yeah. So they are building out and investing a lot in specifically secured clouds just for the government, and the government has a cloud-first sort of policy, and yep. so and now Azure's doing their version of that as well. And so the, the government may become as addicted or reliant on it as the rest of us are also. And so, can, yeah, are they going to throw in some sort of monopoly clause or something? like that it, 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 they're going to cut or off just their separate own the company right or separate the company and say okay uh which wouldn't be the first time that somebody that that's happened to somebody that big right you know amazon has their tentacles in everything which is awesome yeah. because we all love amazon right yeah. um but at what point do they become too big and then someone steps in and even if it's just the perception of, of, of something to happen where people say, OK, uh, you know, IT says, OK, you know what, Microsoft, I think I'm going to put my my, you know, uh, my future in the Microsoft hands. They've never failed me. They never let me down. I never get, you know, no one ever got fired for buying big blue and Microsoft happened to be blue, too. Right. Mm hmm. So, well, uh, by the way, that that doesn't even include, you know, like Oracle and Google, you know, IBM. Well, Oracle has different. Oracle has other problems also, right? You know, transactional databases are not the future, and they have real comp, uh, you know, competition from, you know, uh, uh, some of these these big boy, uh, um, you know, mega scaling, mega transactions per second databases out there. Well, and by the way, if I was them and I had a huge install base of customers and I saw this trend, I mean, like I was at Citrix and they didn't make the adjustment, but if I'm Oracle, I'm acquiring these technologies yeah. and building them into my cloud. And guess what? I have these huge relationships with enterprises around the world. So if I maintain that relationship and I, and I slide new um, technology in, it's even another reason to sell more things to them, right? Yeah. So if they can do that, well... You know, Oracle Cloud, and then there's an opportunity there. The question then goes to Google, right? So Google Cloud. Now, Google has no experience with the enterprise at all, yep. right? So um, do, is, is that okay? I mean, are they going to just win the AI, you know, and sort of the machine learning space and then continue with their ad, uh, you know, juggernaut that they have? Uh, I don't know. But in my mind, it's kind of almost like uh, AWS and Azure, and then you got Oracle Cloud potential, and then you know Google and IBM are somewhere down here. You know, but regardless, uh, that's where the future is. If those companies make continue to make great investments and strong uh, smart business decisions, I see them uh, growing. I mean, take a look at Microsoft. You know, their, even their stock performance over the years, right? You can take a look at how they're investing, and then it's starting to pay off right now. AWS, uh, Google, Azure. You know, uh, strong companies, I think, now and into the future, right? Yeah. And then the, the cool part about this, though, really is, is the shift in the IT organizations. What do IT organizations look like going forward? Because historically, if they were a bunch of PhDs that actually had science projects going on, you know, inside the company, you know, what are they going forward? If science projects, and they had to be science co projects because they were stateful chunks of software that were complicated, Right. But now CPUs and networks and flash and all this stuff is so fast, you can actually build these cloud architectures that are massively scalable and they handle anything that you throw at them. Uh, you no longer need science projects and the PhDs have to find some other work. So they can, they can look inside the company and truly add value to the domain and to, to the go-to-market strategy potentially of these customers. But there's definitely a shift that's going to happen there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well said. Well said. Um, you know, I can't believe we talked for an hour already. So uh, we should probably oh, wrap this cow. things up. But I'm having so much fun that I wasn't even paying attention to the time, which is a good, good sign. Um, <laughs> that being said, so my last question, where do you see WorkSpot in five years? Oh, man, it works in five years. Well, uh, like I said, for us, it's all about the customers. That was one of the things I loved at uh, Citrix as I, I, I was fortunate enough to build the EBC program and then connect with them on the, on the synergy stage was uh, it's all about them. You got to find out what's the most important thing to them and how you can make their lives better, you know? And so I think that's the opportunity that we have at WorkSpot. If we look at our growth now uh, and we multiply this out times the five years, it becomes crazy. You know, Citrix is, is a billion dollar business, multi-billion dollar business. And obviously we are not, there's a lot of customers out there that can use our help for sure. And there's even a lot more customers that have never done VDI or app delivery and so forth that we are helping and we can help so many more of them. So I haven't focused so much on, uh, on where we would end up if we became another brand, um, or if we were massively successful independently, but I do 
think all the time about our architecture, our cloud architecture and our client architecture and how we work uh, delivering hybrid clouds and bringing the insight all into one place. And I do think all the time about how there's so many people around the planet that we can help. We can make their lives so much easier and we can give their businesses back to them, focus their time on their business. And so in five years, you know, my goal in this, and I don't know which year it is along the way, is to get to that first million desktop mark, right? Within our single cloud, we will be the first cloud to have ever managed and run and operated and balanced and controlled and brokered a million desktops all in one place. The architecture is ready for that, uh, and we're ready to bring those customers on and put big smiles on their faces. That's cool. I like it. I like it. Do you, do you want to ask, well, why don't you ask me that question, where I see WorkSpot in five years? Do you want to, want cool. to know my answer? Hey, Doug, where do you see WorkSpot in five years? Well, thank you very much for asking, Brad. <laughs> I, I see it, and I don't know if I see it, but I hope it is. It's a perfect addition to the Amazon workspaces. Oh, oh well, don't say that too loudly. <laughs> I think it's Microsoft a perfect addition. Might... As Amazon, I believe Amazon is a sleeper cell within the workspace or within the VDI space, or within the workspaces, uh, uh, within their workspace product. And I would... Uh, you know, if they pick up, the, they make the right acquisitions uh, and they throw the right talent and the right money at it and they take their time, uh, which they, which is what Bezos is very good at doing, uh, that we could wake up one day and see that our data is sitting in Amazon. Well, you know what? Now we can uh, put our desktops there, too. And uh, some something like what you guys are building would slot perfectly into uh, good old AWS. So. Well, hey, I, I like your prediction. If there's any large, wonderful company... Uh, that we can combine forces with to put uh, even more smiles on even more faces. Uh, we're we're up for the opportunity. <laughs> we'll see if I'm right. I'm, I'm usually never right. Well, actually, I won't say that. I'm, I'm right a lot. I'm wrong a lot too, though. So we're probably fifty fifty, maybe. So anyway, Brad, thank you so much for taking the time to to chat with us today. It's been a pure pleasure, and like I said, I didn't even realize we chatted for so long. So I'll just ask you. I'll just say thank you very much. I'll give you the last word, and at the same time, I'll ask you if somebody wants to learn more, if they want to re reach out to you, if they're at Synergy and they want to see you, what do they need to do? Ah, good. Hey, well, first of all, Doug, thank you so much for inviting me onto your podcast. It was a, it was a huge blast. So I love it. Let's make sure we do it again. Uh, more uh, well sooner than we've taken uh, to do this first one, which has been 15 years, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, and by the way, yeah, we will be. Uh, you, if you want to find me easily, if you want to talk to me at uh, at Synergy, um, it's simple. And by the way, anybody can send me an email. Now, my email isn't what you think. It's not Brad at Workspot dot com. There's actually another guy here with that name already. I let him keep that. I mean, he offered, but I said that's yours. So it's a little more difficult, but it's Brad dot Peterson at uh, Workspot dot com. So P E T E R S O N. Uh, send me an email. Uh, let me know uh, if you're going to be there. And by the way, we can chat uh, whether it's uh, Synergy or not. But if you're going to be there, I'd love to see you in person. I can give you my schedule and let you know exactly where I'm going to be. And uh, and uh, it'd be great uh, to connect to folks that I know, some people that I don't, uh, to talk about this wonderful story you guys heard today. I, uh, I welcome the chance to meet you guys. So brad.peterson at workspot.com. Perfect. And then, of course, the website, workspot.com. So real simple, guys. Uh, very neat technology. Uh, dis it's what we call disruptive, right? <laughs> That's absolutely what we're doing right now. And in the kindest and gentlest of ways, of course. In the kindest and gentlest of ways. <laughs> I love it. Brad, thank you so much. Like I said, it was a true pleasure to have you on. I, I have the greatest life of all. My job is to talk with really smart, really awesome people. And I just achieved that today. So I'm really, really happy. Thank you again. Thanks, Doug. Love it. Hope to do it again soon. <laughs> so that concludes another successful episode of DABCC Radio. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed recording it. And I hope you learned a lot. Brad is a great guy, as you could tell. And, and like I said in the intro, a wonderful conversationalist. And I hope to have him back on the show uh, more often because I can't believe I never did. What a shame. Shame on me. And uh, for, you know, uh, not allowing you guys to hear the, you know, the, the beautiful wisdom from this man. So really, really great stuff. And hope you guys check out what WorkSpot is doing definitely you know reach out to good old brad and and uh the folks over there to learn about more more about what they're doing like i said talk about disruptive this is disruptive and then some great technology uh what else do i say so uh definitely check out workspot.com and and you know let me know what you think too
It's it's an interesting subject, and I get asked about these guys a lot. So, uh, and that's saying something. When everyone's talking about you, there's a reason. So, um, what else do I say? Thanks again, Brad, for taking the time to do this with us. On that note, what do I say? Well, you know, I always want to thank each and every one of you guys for listening to DABCC Radio. Um, you know, we are a, uh, well, search, go on iTunes, search Citrix, search uh, Cloud, search VMware, and, and we come up either number one or number two, and, and that's that's from you guys, you know. Uh, so for listening to us, you have you know, moved us way up the rankings, and uh, um, I thank you very much. Uh, I've been around uh, just this week, in fact, I've been around the world, or not around the world, I've been around the well, I have been around the world, but not this week. Um, this week I've been doing this road show uh, throughout the northeast and the southeast. And I've run into a bunch of different people that have attended our sessions. And and almost everyone I've, I've met, you know, you guys, the listener to the DABCC radio listeners. So thank you so much for those that I met at that show and at those shows and uh, thanks for all the nice comments. So, you know, if you like the episodes, if you like the show, please tell a friend. That's how we grow. You know, shoot an email to someone and say, hey, DABCC Radio is what you want to listen to. Include the link, of course. <laughs> and uh, uh, what else do I say? Tweet it. You know, you name it. Uh, definitely head over to www.dabcc.com for the latest and greatest cloud and virtualization and desktop virtualization and VDI and desktop as a service and mobility, Internet of Things you name it, uh, IT news resources, right? That's what DABCC is, and we've been for, you know, 17 and a half years. Can you believe it's 17 and a half year, years? And we've been podcasting for 11, I think. So this is the 11th or 12th year, I should really figure. It's 11th year. So, yeah, I know it. 11 years. So, well, you know what? I'm rambling at this point. Again, thanks to each and every one of you guys for listening to what? DABCC Radio. C-C? D-A-B-C. Say it again. D-A-B-C-C. D-A-B-C. Can you say it again? D-A-B-C-C. D-A-B-B-C. How about D-A-B-C-C? D-A-B-B-C. D-A-B-C-C. 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 D-A-B-C-C.